it. Um, Willow, Willow Young is a Jungian analyst in private practice in Santa Barbara and Ventura, California. She is a training analyst at the C.G. Jung Study Center of Southern California and serves as an analytic supervisor. Retired from service as distinguished core professor at Pacifica Graduate Institute, Willow continues to teach as adjunct faculty. Additionally, she pursues her analytic studies at the Research and Training Center for Depth Psychology, according to C.G. Jung and Marie-Louise von Franz in Switzerland. Willow's training in the cultural archetypes of the collective unconscious includes graduate studies at Pacifica Graduate Institute, undergraduate studies in world arts and cultures at UCLA, field work in Guatemala, and as director of special programs at the Craft and Folk Art Museum. She served as the Los Angeles coordinator for the Today programs, three month international cultural exchanges funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. As well, she worked for many years with indigenous populations from around the world, exploring each group's cultural heritage through the unifying theme of the mask. And so I'm very pleased to turn the program over now to Willow Young. Unmute yourself, Willow. Oh, let me, uh, here we go. Okay, am I, am I? Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> That's a little. Uh, I'm getting it. Okay. I'm just standing back. So is it clear? Can you, Can you hear, hear me? Yeah. Not too loud. loud. I hear you fine. Okay, okay good. good. Judy, Judy, thank you. <laughs> There's, There's so, so many hurdles. Leap, leap over, over and then virtual reality. reality. And, and I thank all of you for joining us. Judy, I think I'm getting a loop back because I'm hearing it. On your, your volume, volume on my computer. computer, or is it my computer? Okay, I'm not hearing it now. So everybody, welcome and thank you for joining us on this Sunday. We're in California, so it's Sunday late afternoon, and wherever the others of you are, I I send you a hearty welcome to joining us. I was um, particularly grateful that Judy and the board were able to segue from, from in-person meetings in Orange County to a virtual format. I know it took a, many, many learning curves and, and uh, for me, it's been a process of feeling like an old dog learning new tricks, but we're going to do the best we can today I think what's most important is to be able to present the material because it's relevant to what we're experiencing uh, as we find ways to build relationships with those who have opposing views from our own. And it's a way to dive into kind of the archival history of, of the story of Jung and to add to that. Uh, there's, there's some new material that's been released to the Opus Archive and Research Center in Los Angeles. I mean, not Los Angeles, at Pacifica. Uh, the archive is located on the campus of Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpinteria. But again, I wanted uh, to, to heartily thank club president Judy Kaufman and program officer Holly Fincher for supporting uh, this program and for inviting me. Uh, it was scheduled, I think, sometime in the summer, and then it was rescheduled for December. So here we are. Um, I presented previously in 2014 at the Young Club when meetings were held in person in that beautiful room that you use. And at that time, I presented on my material of the archetypal motif of the wounded healer. Uh, represented by the historical and mythic figure of Asclepius. So I have in the back of my mind that space. And luckily I was able to hear Holly's presentation uh, not too long ago. So have a fresh memory of that experience. I want to say also really honor and salute you, Judy and the board for not only going live with, with these virtual programs, but offer, for making the ethical decision to offer these programs for free. 
It's, I think, a, a profoundly valuable contribution, especially during this time when so many of us have limited social interaction. It's a great opportunity to present to each other and to be in community. And hopefully you'll all stick around for questions and answers, if only just to say hello. So we get to wave and see each other a little bit. I'll be imagining a, a buffet table at the back of the room that we would have broken it, you know, we would have broken bread and cookies and other things together at the end or at the beginning. I can't remember how that worked, but nonetheless, there's nourishment for the, for the physical soul as well. Uh, so, and, and like Judy, I want to really encourage everyone who hasn't already to join the, the Jung, CG Young Club of Orange County. It, it's not a particularly robust fee. It's rather nominal for, for what one gets, but it's a way for us to continue our, our conversation about Jung and other things that matter a great deal to us. So I, I and support that and encourage it. I do want to acknowledge that, that all research and really I can't think of anything in our life that, that isn't an ongoing meaningful collaboration. So Judy, thank you for collaborating with me on this presentation, for prepping me and talking to me on the phone when I was so nervous about it. Am I in the right Zoom session? Um, really greatly appreciate that. And I also wanted to, so that is to say that even my presentation is a collaborative effort. Uh, contributions from many people and I highly value their support. For example, Santos Artiago, who is a collegial staff at Pacifica, uh, helped me find some material and helped me work it into my PowerPoint. Consultant and creative director Tony Dianca uh, is largely responsible for me getting my website up and running, willowyoung.com. And my many colleagues with whom I have the pleasure of studying Jungian material in reading groups and colloquia. Additionally, Jennifer Maxson, who's the director of the Opus Art Archive and Research Center, assisted with extensive archival details and photographic permissions and made it possible to by sending me things, either scanning them uh, or whatever, so I didn't have to go get in the car and drive up there. It's not that far, but nonetheless, it's, it's better to have contactless uh, sharing of material. Um, and additionally, my husband, Thomas Friedman, and my daughter, Maya Friedman, provided life support in innumerable and immeasurable ways. So I'd like to thank them also. I wanna say a little bit about what drew me to this interest. Um, the context of my life uh, is interwoven with this material and it's somewhat of a disclosure statement, but I think it helps for us to know what, what it is in someone's personal life that draws them to the material. Uh, so I could say that I've had a lifelong interest in native cultures, creative expression, wisdom, and people. Early childhood dreams of ancient figures and the experience of wild nature impacted me greatly. As a child, I lived on a farm in Vermont and off the coast of Massachusetts on an island. The expanse of nature and the reality of First Nation people whose land we inhabited were living realities to me. On Nantucket and later in the 1960s, living in Alexandria, Virginia, near the Potomac, the neighborhoods in which we lived carried the name of the local Native American settlements which had formerly occupied the area. In the 1970s and early 80s, while I was studying at UCLA in the World Arts and Cultures program, I traveled to Arizona with Jungian analysts, Katie and Sandy Sanford. Our traveling caravan included Jungian analyst, John A. Sanford, known as Jack, and his wife, Linny Sanford, and Joe Mitchell. 
Previous to those journeys, in the 1950s, Katie and Sandy developed a close personal relationship with Henry and May Polanyama in Araibi, Third Mesa on the Hopi Indian Reservation. We had the honor and privilege of being Henry's guests at the snake dance ceremony held every other year in August. Attending the ceremonies taught me the importance of being quiet, respectful, a humble witness, to listen deeply and be at ease in a natural state of presence and easy good humor. It was impressed upon me to not dominate another with my privilege and good intentions. We attended this ceremony throughout those years until it was closed to non-natives. And then in the early 1980s and early 1990s, I visited the, the home of artists Frank and Nancy Romero, friends whose home in Arroyo Ondo afforded easy views across the fields to the Taos Pueblo and Taos Mountain. Several times I attended the Buffalo dance at the Taos Pueblo held each year on January 6th and can attest to the bitter cold of the winter day as winds blew down Taos Mountain. Now I will turn to the presentation, but before I launch into it, I'd like to clarify the use of Ocuebiano's various names. His Pueblo name is Ocuebiano, meaning mountain lake. For Blue Lake is a sacred lake high in the mountains of Taos Mountain Range. Biano is also known as Tony Mirabal, a name he used in communicating with non-natives. In his correspondence with Jung, Biano referred to himself and signed his letters, Okwe Biano. Later, in his letters with the Sanfords, he referred to himself as Tony Mirabal of the Taos Pueblo. He was a member of the Taos Pueblo Council and he lived there until he died. So while discussing Jung's Tao journey to Taos and his experience and letters with Okwe Biano, I'm going to use the name Okwe Biano. And when we segue into the discussion regarding the Sanford's material, I'll use his non-native name, Tony Mirabal. And I hope that won't be too confusing to any of you, uh, but it, I think it speaks to um, cultural interface in, in a way that's potentially very meaningful. So I think at this time, I'm going to share my screen. I can manage that, oops. Let's see, share my screen. Oh, good. There it is. Okay, are you able to see it? Yeah, everyone's able to see it. And yes. Okay. Okay. So as Judy had mentioned, this title, the title of this talk is Eros and the Value of Relatedness. C.G. Young and Okuya Biano, The Lineage of an Enduring Friendship. And this is a photograph of C.G. Young circa 1935, 10 years after his trip to, um, to New Mexico. Well, yes, Arizona and New Mexico. So I don't have as many slides as I have words. So there, we're going to be spending a lot of time looking at, at images on the screen. I hope that you can just sit back and relax and enjoy them. Uh, there'll be more slides later on. So Jung's journey in December 24th to the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico and his meeting Aquibiano demonstrates what is for me evidence of a characteristic relational capacity of Jung and analytical psychology. This initial encounter in January 1925 began an enduring lineage of engagement, which has endured beyond Jung's death 
1961. In the spring of 1928, British psych psychiatrist and colleague of Jung's, H.G. Peter Baines and Carrie Jan Hello visited Vienna on their way to California. Decades later, Jung's grandson, analyst Dieter Baumann, added to the lineage and his visit to Taos Pueblo in 1963. Baumann's visit is recorded in the, in the 1989 film, Wisdom of the Dream. Stories of the Jung, Baines, and Bauman visits to Taos Pueblo are part of public record. Today, I'll add to the public discourse material that's held in the material collection of the Opus Archive and Research Center. This presentation relies upon correspondence and items in the material archive at Opus and document, documents the relational and ethical thread of authentic friendship as it was carried by union analysts, Dr. James Kirsch of Los Angeles and W.R. Sandler, not William, otherwise known as Sandy, and his wife, Catherine M. Sanford, union analyst and author of The Serpent and the Sacred Cross always referred to as Katie. This presentation explores the experience of encounter and the inherent fundamental respect for and interest in an other. In this case, a person whose being and culture differ greatly from one's own. Jung was notably impacted by meeting, by meeting with Aquaviano the story of which is recorded in Jung's Memory Dreams Reflections in the chapter on travels. It's well worth reviewing his chapter on travels, which recounts the impactful meeting as it adjusted his limited European perspective and added to his understanding of the objective psyche and ever developing ideas about typological orientation the archetypes of the collective unconscious and the value of self-work, especially as it intersected outer life, one's family, community, country, in fact, the whole world. Throughout this presentation, I will expand upon the ethical response demonstrated by Jung to the reality of cultural and philosophical difference. In contemporary experience, we are engaged, as I had mentioned earlier, in encounters with the other on a global scale and are asked to become conscious of the lived experience of others who are personally very different from ourselves and from each other. And globally, we're in the midst of a transition from one ion, the Piscean age, to that of the Aquarian age. It is historically typical during such times of transition that the collective we does not feel held by a unifying whole. The tension of the opposites is pulled tight and the center point is experienced as unable to endure the tension. I assert the tradition and practice of analytical psychology may offer an attitude with which to con constitute ourselves, enabling us to host and experience an encounter with another in which we feel both the dynamism of the united whole and the dynamism of the opposites. As we are experiencing today in the collective discourse in the United States, we've all probably heard the phrase which has become popular of late they live in an alternative universe. As a reference to those with, different view, with views different from one's own, the foundational practice of dream work and active imagination may indeed serve to support encounters of difference experienced in the outer world. The inherently engaged attention to and relationship with dream figures themselves often quite different from our outer world lived reality introduces us to extraordinary, strange, and unfamiliar figures 
and images, thereby making the unknown more known. The practice of attending to inner figures may indeed enable the possibility of respectful dialogue with people of difference, if nothing more than for the mutuality of living together on this planet. It is my experience that ensuing dialogues, deep understanding and necessary reparations hold the seeds for potential mutual transformation and deep relatedness. This presentation, as I've already noted, examines the relationship between Jung and Biano as a, as a paradigm for experiencing the other and tells the story of the story of an Alessand's colleagues and student of Jungian ideas living in Los Angeles and Del Mar, California. My archival research is based on, but not limited to letter, letters in the material collection of the Opus Archive and Research Center, which is located on the Ladera campus of the graduate of Pacifica Graduate Institute in Carpinteria. So today, December 13th, 2020, is synchronistically the anniversary of Jung's departure on December 13th, 1924, from the port in Bremen, Germany, on a steamer bound for New York. Jung left his, somehow this, well, basically, Jung left his home on December 10th, took a train to Bremen, Germany, and boarded the ship. The crossing was so rough, it arrived a full day late in New York on December 22nd, 1924. Jung was met dockside by recent Princeton graduate, Fowler McCormick, son of Harold and Edith Rockefeller McCormick as well, George Porter, son of the builder of the Chicago and Eastern Illinois Railroad and Chicago's Dearborn Station. A graduate of Yale University, Porter served as an army captain in World War I and had been treated by Jung for melancholia. Also greeting Jung Dockside was New York resident author and Jungian analyst, Dr. Frances Wicks. Wicks had befriended Okwe Biano during her previous visits to the Taos Pueblo and was among those that encouraged Jung's visit to Taos. Jung, McCormick and Porter stayed at the university club and departed December 25th, taking the train to Chicago where Jung was the house guest of Porter. On December 27th, McCormick, Porter, and Jung boarded the Santa Fe Railroad's California Limited to the Grand Canyon, arriving New Year's Day, 1925. They were met by linguist Dr. Jaime de Angulo, who had previously visited with Jung in Switzerland and who would serve to introduce Jung to Okoibiano in Taos. Jung's trip was multi-layered. He traveled from New York to Chicago to consult with the McCormick family regarding mat family matters. Then he traveled to the Grand Canyon in Arizona. He and his companions then motored to New Mexico for the express purpose of meeting with Alcoibiano, whom he had heard stories of from colleagues and Allison's and friends. Following, a ten, following 10 days in Taos, Jung traveled to New Orleans then on to St. Elizabeth's Hospital outside of Washington, D.C., where he delivered a paper, consulted with patients, and consulted with doctors and other clinical staff. He concluded his travels on January 13, 1925, with a visit and discussion with analytic colleagues at the home of Christine Mann in New York City before departing the next day January 14th on the ship La France. We have that from the New York Times, which posted an announcement that Jung had made a, an, an unadvertised trip to the United States. So imagine with me, if you will, a very cold January 6th, 1925, 
7,200 feet in elevation, Swiss psychiatrist and Taos Pueblo Tribal Council President Akwe Piano stand together talking on the roof of the thousand year old Taos Pueblo in bitter cold winter weather as the scent of burning pinion rises from the round red ovens below. It was 22 degree Fahrenheit on that day in Taos, New Mexico. And I wondered what led to the meeting between the two men, what transpired them between them following that seminal conversation later recorded in Memory Streams of Re Reflections. What is the enduring legacy of their initial contact and the ensuing friendship? These and other questions I explore today and examine the relationship between Jung and Biano as a paradigm for experiencing the other, as I had noted before. So much of human history can be written in terms of ignorance, vilification, demonization, defense, and war against the other. What does analytical psychology offer us as we navigate these turbulent times and as we learn to live and relate with multifarious others internally and externally? And externally. Is there anything in the Jungian lineage that may help us confront the power complex that enables the denigration of the other as enacted historically in the United States and other countries? It's important to me to remember that cultural complex with which we live includes more than diversity of race, ethnicity, religion, and indigenous heritage. It also includes age, gender, sexual orientation, developmental and acquired disabilities, socioeconomic status, privilege, and typological orientation. Today in the United States, in response to the political divide gripping the nation, we live with a diversity of political affiliation. We live with differentiation and distance. And we live in a unified field of being, which is sometimes very difficult to realize and to feel. With this task, I strive to hold the tension of the opposites as represented within the context of the unified field and the polarities of varied cultural experience. I was thinking that the unified field that we're currently dealing with is the reality of the pandemic. It is throughout the globe. It is a global experience and it crosses every possible divide that we might imagine. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the ethical response demonstrated by Jung to the reality of cultural and philosophical difference and the golden thread of relatedness that hopefully will become evident throughout this talk that was important to Jung and comprised an important aspect of his scientific studies. He noted in a conversation with Dr. M. Esther Harding, there is a third kind of relationship the only lasting one in which it is as though there were an invisible telegraph wire between two human beings. Jung said, I call it to myself, the golden thread. This may be masked by other forms of relationship and other forms may be present without any such thread in them. It is only when the veil of Maya of illusion is rent for us that we can begin to recognize the golden thread. So if we keep in mind this golden thread of relatedness, I would like to begin exploring the contributing influences which provided a context for understanding the meeting between Okwe Biano and Jung. With this review of their mutually meaningful encounter as Hans Dieckmann wrote, perhaps we help turn the power principle which forms the background of the exploitation of nature into a relationship principle, Eros. So what in Jung's professional history contributed to his general openness to those far from Jung in culture, place, and time? 
I suggest we see it clearly in Jung's interest in the phenomenology, phenomenological exploration of the natural sciences, an interest in and desire to understand the unknown. His curiosity stimulated his natural consideration of opposing points of view, as in his childhood query, am I the boy sitting upon a rock or am I the rock upon whom a boy is sitting? It was important to Jung, scientist and psychiatrist, to explore the hypothesis and counter hypothesis of ideas as he analyzed dreams, engaged in dialogues with inner figures as recorded in the black and red books. And as he wrangled emergent ideas with colleagues when developing his ideas about complex psychology, analytical psychology, typology, alchemy, and synchronicity. We see it as well in the historical context of the administrative and medical philosophy of the Bergolzi Psychiatric Clinic. This is a field outside uh, in an area near the Bergolzi, which is located outside of Zurich in a field. This isn't the exact field. This field is actually in Zolikon, not far from the Bergolzi. This is a picture of Jürgen Bleuler, um, of whom we'll be speaking. So what was notable about the Bregoldsley Psychiatric Clinic and Hospital of Zurich the, was the treatment based upon an alienation between doctors and patients was replaced with the radical notion that the secret of successful therapy resided in the personal attitude of the psychotherapist. And this was a contribution in the 1880s by then hospital director, August Farrell. We know that amongst Farrell's students was Jürgen Bleuler, who became one of Switzerland's most prominent psychiatrists. Bleuler was determined to understand his patients as medical director of the Rheinau Mental Hospital, a large asylum for the aged demented patients, considered to be one of Switzerland's most backward institutions, Bleuler was involved in all aspects of patient care, taking part in their physical treatment, organizing work therapy, and achieving a close emotional contact with each one of his patients. He thus attained a unique understanding of mental patients and the most intimate details of their psychological life. From this experience, he drew the substance of his future book on schizophrenia and his text on psychiatry. In, 19, in 1898, Bleuler succeeded Farrell as head of the Bregoldsley. This is an etching 18, from the 18, uh, late 90s of the Bregoldsley Institute. It's a massive, building and as you can see it's it's surrounded by nature there's a little bit more community built these days but it still has a feeling of being in nature we can go back and we can rest our eyes on the clouds hovering above the Bregoldsley hospital So in 1898, Bleuler succeeded Farrell as head of the Bregolzli. Generally, and differently from Bleuler, psychiatric, psychiatry teachers were not interested in what the patient had to say. In fact, many of the doctors and nurses in the early days of the Bregolzli came from Germany and spoke proper German, not the Swiss dialect of Swiss German. So they couldn't really understand what the patients were saying. Bleuler made every attempt to understand a category of people, schizophrenics, who had never been understood before. He not only talked with them in their own dialect, but made every possible effort to understand the meaning of their supposedly senseless utterings and delusions. Bleuler was thus able to establish an emotional contact with each of his patients. Bleuler's work contributed to the reputation of the Bregolzli as one of the most important research hospitals. It drew doctors from throughout Europe and America who came to observe and study. 
It was into the clinical environment created by Bloiler that Jung came in 1900 as assistant physician to the Bergoldsley. It was Jung's psychiatric research on, uh, on association experiments designed initially to provide a tool for the differential diagnosis of mental disorders that ultimately shed light on the psychology of the unconscious. As noted by historian, or I guess we could say psychological historian, Sonusham Dasani, or Jung scholar, Sonusham Dasani, Jung was in the lineage of August Forel, the Swiss neuropathologist and previous director of the Bergolzi Psychiatric Hospital, who had been a corresponding member of several local Boston medical societies since the 1880s. Among his two best students, Jürgen Bleuler became Switzerland's most prominent psychiatrist, and Adolf Mayer, an older student of Farrell's, became the foremost psychiatrist in the United States. It was through Adolf Mayer that Jung's researches initially became known in North America. The psychotherapeutic circles were very interested in his researches on the word association experiment and his researches on the unconscious. So Jung was known uh, to the, his colleagues in the United States long before uh, psychoanalysis developed and his association with Freud. It is this introduction to North American psychiatric circles that would enable Jung's contact with American psychiatrists and psychologists, among them Dr. White at St. Elizabeth Psychiatric Hospital near Washington, DC, the renowned philosopher and psychologist, Dr. William James at Harvard, with whom Jung shared extensive contact, Dr. Gilbert of Portland, Oregon, and doctors Beatrice Hinkle, Christine Mann, Eleanor Bertine, M. Esther Harding, and Francis Wicks of New York City. Jung, like Broiler, was interested in what the patient experienced. He asked what actually takes place within the mind of the mentally ill. Is there meaning in the visions, rantings, and impromptu monologues by the patients? These questions posed by Jung reflected his interest in the internal landscape of his patients, which Jürgen Bleuler encouraged. The relational capacity demonstrated and utilized by Bleuler in his treatment of the mentally ill became foundational to analytical psychology and activates to this day an open curiosity and respect for the other as it or they appear in dreams, visions, and the consciously hosted inner dialogues that emerge during the process of active imagination. Building an empathetic relationship with the other, whether an inner or outer figure, require, requires a confrontation with one's persona, an encounter with one's own shadow, and an exploration of one's internal material. Required is the humbling of a well-established ego and cultivation of an ethical attitude. I just want to pause for a moment. This is Jung standing at the entrance to the Bergoldsley. Jung writes in his memorandum to UNESCO in 1947 entitled Techniques of Attitude Change Conducive to World Peace. It must be emphasized that mental attitude is a concept which is, does not describe or define accurately enough what we understand by this term. The attitude R method, meaning the method of analytical psychology is concerned. So the attitude R method is concerned with is not only a mental, but a moral phenomenon. An attitude is governed and sustained by a dominant conscious idea accompanied by a so-called feeling tone i.e. an emotional value 
which accounts for the efficacy of the idea. So Jung's desire to understand the soul of the European by looking outside its cultural boundaries developed when he was working on the transcription of his 1913-1914 dreams, visions, and fantasies that comprised his confrontation with the unconscious. His ego had undergone a significant <clears throat> inner and outer humbling. He was also seeking to understand more deeply the historical and cultural content of the collective unconscious to experience the human psyche in all its manifestations. Additionally, Jung had heard stories from anthropologists and Alicens and friends, Carrie Fink down hello and Jaime down hello, Francis Wicks, George Porter, and Edith Rockefeller McCormick and Harold McCormick about the secret yet vivid religious practices of the Pueblo. This is a more contemporary image of the Burke-Oldsley Hospital. At Taos, Jung and Okoibiano discussed the living relationship with the, sun, with the sun experienced by inhabitants of Taos Pueblo the archetypal motif of the sun and surrounding mythology had been meaningful to Jung for decades. In 1906, Jung worked with the solar phallus hallucination of a schizophrenic patient at the Bregoldsley. Jung writes, one day, I came across him there in the corridor, blinking through the window up at the sun and moving his head from side to side in a curious manner. He took me by the arm and said he wanted to show me something. He said, I must look at the sun with eyes half shut and then I could see the sun's phallus. If I moved my head from side to side, the sun phallus would move too. And that was the origin of the wind. In the course of the year 1910, when I was engrossed in mythological studies, a book of Diderik's came into my hands. It was part of the so-called Paris Magic Papyrus and was thought by Diderik to be a liturgy of the Mithraic cult. It consisted of a series of instructions, invocations, and visions. One of the visions is described in the following words. And likewise, the so-called tube, the origin of the ministering wind, for you will see hanging down from the disk of the sun, something that looks like a tube. And toward the regions westward, it is as though there were an infinite east wind. But if the other wind should prevail, perhaps the, re the regions of the east, you will in like manner see the vision veering in that direction. The Greek word for tube means wind instrument. So evidently a stream of wind is blowing through the tube of the sun. And then Jung continues, the vision of my patient in 1906 and the Greek te text first edited in 1910 should be sufficiently far apart to rule out the possibility of cryptomnesia on his side, the patient's side, and of thought transference on mine. The obvious parallelism of the two visions is analogous with certain medieval paintings in which this tube is depicted as a sort of hose pipe reaching down from heaven under the robe of Mary. Well, I looked for such medieval images and I couldn't find them, but I did find uh, something that relates to, to the next uh, bit of material he came across. In it, the Holy Ghost flies down in the form of a dove to impregnate the Holy Virgin. Jung continues, and as we know from the miracle of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost was originally conceived as a mighty rushing wind, the wind that bloweth where it listeth. In the Latin translated text, we read, they say that a spirit descends through the disk of the sun. 
Jung wrote, I cannot therefore discover anything fortuitous in these visions, but simply the revival of possibilities of ideas that have always existed and that can be found again in the most diverse minds and in all epochs and are therefore not to be mistaken as inherited ideas. I have purposefully gone into the details of this case in order to give you a concrete picture of the deeper psychic activity, which I call the collective unconscious. So you can see, do you see my browser around the sun and the, 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 the dove, the Holy Ghost descending, the fire of the sun coming down? And we see it here, the fiery sun and the Holy Ghost coming down. This remarkable case prompted me to undertake various researches, including consultation with William Allison White at St. Elizabeth's in Washington, DC, where Jung confirmed again, the source of another dream featuring mythological themes and images from a patient who had no prior knowledge of the mythological content of his dream. This led Jung to suppose the experiences, hallucinations and visions we're not a question of specifically racial heredity, but of universally human characteristic, nor is it a question of, an in, of inherited ideas, but of a functional disposition to produce the same or very similar ideas. This disposition I later, around 1919, called the archetype. An archetype is a psychic energy undetermined by content and with the potential to coalesce into an image. We understand such images to be representations of psychic energy or archetypal motifs. The representations themselves are not inherited, rather only the forms are inherited and correspond in every way to the instincts. Relevant to our topic today, the image of the sun is one such archetypal motif. Jung was also riveted by reading Frederick Fruster's The Symbolism and Mythology of Ancient Peoples, the research of which fueled Jung's work on symbols of transformation from 1907 to its publication in 1912. From his research developed knowledge of the visions of the Mithraic literature, which feature many variations of the sun motif. So in 1913, 1914, the figure of the sun appeared in Jung's confrontation with his unconscious. During the ensuing 16 years, Jung was engaged in a similar process of trying to understand and come into relationship with the images and visions that erupted from his unconscious. At the time, Jung forged a process that evolved into a therapeutic method called active imagination which involved conscious and recorded dialogue with the inner other as it appeared in dreams, fantasies, and visions. His calligraphic rework of the sketches, paintings, and dialogues with his inner figures noted in the black books were the basis for, as we know, for Liber Novus known as the red book, red because of its red leather binding, which you see an image here. And Jung writes in the Red Book, one of his fantasies. It happened that I opened the egg and that the God left the egg. He was healed and his figure shone transformed. And I knelt like a child and could not grasp the miracle. He who had been pressed into the core of the beginning rose up and not a trace of illness could be found on him. And when I thought that I had caught the mighty one and held him in my cupped hands. He was the sun itself. I wandered towards the east where the sun rises. I probably wanted to rise too, as if I were the sun. I wanted to embrace the sun and rise with it into daybreak. 
Jung's own visions and fantasies preceded his visit to Tao's Pueblo in 1925 by 11 or 12 years and formed the background for the conversations with Alcoibiano. William McGuire, in his 1978 article that appeared in Spring Journal, clarifies some logistical details. He notes, some of this I've, I've mentioned uh, previously, but it's nice to hear McGuire make his own account. He notes, Jung departed Kuznak Wednesday, December 10th, 1924, took the train to Bremen, Germany, boarded the steamer for Bremen, from Bremen, Germany on December 13th and arrived in New York December 22nd in the midst of a cold snowstorm. Jung celebrated Christmas Eve in a Pullman car with two men who had been in analysis with, with him and with whom he experienced the golden thread of relatedness. Charlotte McCormick and George F. Porter. They traveled first to Chicago and then to Santa Fe, where they met Dr. Jaime D'Angelo, who served as a translator. According to McGuire, Porter had invited Jung, made all the arrangements, and financed Jung's entire trip, including the sojourn to New Orleans and St. Elizabeth's Hospital outside of Washington, D.C. Porter had previously visited Jung in Zurich and, had, and they continued a valued friendship until Porter's death in 1927. So as we can see from this map, there's the Grand Canyon. They motored then on I-40 going across the state of Arizona. Uh, it's noted that they stopped at two well-known trading posts at which Jung bought Kachina dolls. Uh, and then they eventually motored on up passing Santa Fe going on up to Taos. This is the road to Taos looking south back towards Santa Fe as they make their way up to um, 7,200 7, feet. Again, on the road to Taos, this is going through Chuchas, New Mexico. And in the background, we see the, the Sangre de Cristo mountain range. This is a close up of the old highway leading up to Taos and out into Taos Pueblo. And you see the reach of the Taos Pueblo lands. So Dian Hello has visited Jung in Kuznacht in 1923, analyzing with him in May and August. Dian Hello writes of spending time with Jung on a little island in the middle of Lake Zurich. And Sam Dasani notes that Jung and Dian Hello went to Bollingen in 1923. There they talked about Heine's theory of primitive thought from an anthropological and linguistic point of view as contrasted with Jung's mythological and philosophical perspective. Dianghalo had uh, attended medical school in uh, Johns Hopkins and become a linguist and was working in California affiliated with Berkeley. Uh, and he would travel around the state of California studying the language of the Native American tribes as well, he traveled to Arizona and New Mexico and uh, had spent time at the Taos Pueblo uh, learning their language. So he was well positioned as, uh, as a linguist to, to join this trip. So at the time of the trip to Taos, Jung was 49 years old. He would, this photograph in 1925, uh, Jung was born July 26, 1875. So at the time of the trip to Taos, Jung was 49 and Biano was 40. They were generational peers, bridging a great cultural divide. Each had strong roots in his cultural and family ancestry, each valued nature each in his own way was interested in coming to terms with the collective historical character of the prevailing dominant culture. 
and each had a mythic relationship to the sun. It's an old photograph of Taos Pueblo. Uh, you know, the bridge. Jung writes about, or actually Kirsch writes about, you have to cross this little bridge to get to uh, Biano's room. Looking towards Taos Mountain across the fields to the Pueblo. Another view on a sunny day of the north section of Taos Pueblo. Another view of the north side. So Blue Lake, just to make note of this, is located in a in a indentation, small valley uh, of this mountain. And after uh, Blue Lake and the 48 thousand acres that was eventually returned to the tribe. The tribe also arranged with the FAA to not permit any planes to fly over Blue Lake. So that there are no air travel allowed uh, over the Pueblo and over uh, Blue Lake. So I put this slide in because it shows the ladders, uh, young rights of, of climbing the ladders up to the fourth story. Jung and Biano climbed up the rough wooden ladders to the fourth story of the main Pueblo building and talked about the Pueblo religion, about the Anglos, about the father's son and the ceremony performed each day by the people of the Pueblo. The golden thread of relatedness comprised as it is in part by genuine interest in the other combined with a deep respect for and sense of value of the other basic tenets, as we know, of human relationship. Jung was genuinely interested in Biano and the religious life of the Pueblo. Jung valued Biano's perspective, thoughts, and feelings, which enabled him to fully take in what Biano said to him. Biano helped Jung to see and acknowledge the shadow of Western history as rooted in the following quote. which I'll read to, to you in a moment. I just, I want to show you a few images of men that were also uh, seen on the, the rooftops the morning that Jung and Viano had their conversation. This is a man who's wrapped in a buffalo robe. One way to stay warm on a cold winter day. And this is an image of Okwe Biano taken in 1925. So Jung wrote, the Indian has struck a vulnerable spot. Oh, this Indian has struck a vulnerable spot and veiled a truth to which we are blind. I felt rising within me like a shapeless myth, something unknown and yet deeply familiar. Out of this mist, image upon image detached itself. First Roman legions smashing into the cities of Gaul and the keenly incised features of Julius Caesar, Scipio, Africanus, and Pompey. I was the Roman eagle on the North Sea and on the banks of the White Nile. Then I saw St. Augustine transmitting Christian creed to the Britons on the tips of the Roman lances and Charlemagne's most glorious forced conversations of the heathen, then the pillaging and murdering bands of the crusading armies. With a secret stab, I realized the hollowness of that old romanticism about the crusades. Then followed Columbus, Cortez, and the other conquistadores who with fire, sword, torture, and Christianity came down upon even these remote Pueblos dreaming peacefully in the sun, their father. I saw too the peoples of the Pacific Islands decimated by firewater, syphilis, and scarlet fever carried in the clothes the missionaries forced on them. It was enough. What we from our point of view call colonization, missions to the heathen, spread of civilization, etc., has another face. 
the face of a bird of prey seeking with cruel intentness for distant quarry, a face worthy of a race of pirates and highwaymen. All the eagles and other predatory creatures that adorn our coats of arms seem to me to be apt psychological representatives of our true nature. I found that to be a rather searing quote. And imagine that vision or image coming to Jung as he's standing on rooftop talking with Alcoy Biano. And Jean Dasani writes, the significance of anthropology for Jung did not only lie in the quest for knowledge of other cultures, he held that it was only through contact with other cultures that one can see one's own culture from the outside, just as one only becomes aware of one's own natural peculiarities through meeting people from other nations. It was through this conversation with Biano that his desire to see the European from the outside was fulfilled. In the recently published Black Books, editor, Jung scholar, historical archivist, and professor Sonusham Dasani includes the following quote from the editorial transcript of Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. My experiences during the years of 1913, 1914 had burdened me with a tangle of problems whose nature demanded that I should study the psychic life of non-Europeans. For I suspected that the questions put to me were just so many compensations for my European prejudices. What I had seen in North Africa and what Okwiabiano Mountain Lake told me were the first clues to an adequate explanation of my experiences. Further on, Chandasani writes, thus Jung's travels were directly connected to the material in the Black Books and Liber Novus and formed part of an attempt to understand these by placing them within a wider historical and geographic context. Jung here indicates that what he personally went through could also be conceived of as a de-Europeanization, extrapolating from this the import for Westerners of the exploration of the collective unconscious could also be conceived of from this perspective. The task was one of reaching a balance, synthesis of the Western and the primitive through his self-experimentation, he formed a critical imperative based upon based not upon any particular content, but the attitude of the individual toward it. And in particular, whether an individual could accommodate such material into his worldview. So you can imagine I was very excited when I received my profoundly heavy copy of the Black Books and found this quote that, that helps us and helps us see ever more clearly the extent to which Jung's work uh, on the Black Books and his, his work stemming from uh, the Red Book, which helped to form uh, some of the foundational thoughts that are present in the collective works going forward. <coughs> Jung wondered how, for example, can we become conscious of national peculiar peculiarities if we never had the opportunity to regard our own nation from outside. Regarding it from outside means regarding it from the standpoint of another nation. I became aware of how completely, even in America, I was still caught up and imprisoned in the cultural consciousness of the white man. I, I, sorry, I just want to not go into that quite yet. In, in Taos, there I had for the first time the good fortune to talk with a non-European. That, that, that is to a non-white. I was able to talk with him as I've rarely been able to talk with a European. See, Okwebiana said, how cruel the whites look. Their lips are thin, their nose is sharp, their faces furrowed and distorted by folds. Their eyes have a staring expression. 
they're always seeking something. What are they seeking? The whites always want something. They're always uneasy and restless. We do not know what they want. We do not understand them. We think they are mad. I asked him why he thought the whites were all mad. And Biano replied, they say they think with their heads. Why, of course, what do you think with, I asked him in surprise. We think here, he said, indicating my heart, his heart, indicating his heart. I fell into a long meditation for the first time in my life. So it seemed to me someone had drawn for me a picture of the real white man. As I sat with Okwe Biano on the roof, the blazing sun rising higher and higher, he said, pointing to the sun, is not he who moves there our father? How can anyone say differently? How can there be another God? Nothing can be without the sun. What would a man do alone in the mountains? He cannot even build a fire without him. The sun is God. Everyone can see that. I asked him, you think then that what you do in your religion benefits the whole world? Of course. If we did not do it, what would become of the world? After all, he said, we are a people who live on the roof of the world. We are the sons of Father Son. And with our religion, we daily help our Father to go across the sky. We do this not only for ourselves, but for the whole world. If we were to chase, to cease practicing our religion, in 10 years, the sun would no longer rise. Then it would be night forever. I want to read this part again because it, it relates greatly to an idea of Jung's that we'll discuss later. We do this not only for ourselves, but for the whole world. If we were to cease practicing our religion in 10 years, the sun would no longer rise. Then it would be night forever. It's possible the extended research into the archetypal motif of the sun, inclusive of associations and cultural amplifications, sensitized Jung and enabled in him a receptivity to the ideas and practices Akwe Biano shared with them. Jung wrote, the idea absurd to us that a ritual act can magically affect the sun is upon closer examin examination, no less irrational but far more familiar to us than might at first be assumed. Our Christian religion, like every other incidentally, is permeated by the idea that special acts or a special kind of action can influence God. For example, through certain rites or by prayer or by a morality pleasing to the divinity. Following Jung's visit, in 1925, Jung and Akwe Biano corresponded intermittently. Mountain Lake was the English name of Akwe Biano, a Pueblo elder who talked to Jung about the tribal life of the Taos Indians in the 1920s and about their traditional religion. His granddaughter, Martha Suazo, still lives in Taos and has preserved the letters which Mountain Lake wrote to Jung later. My grandfather was uh, all up in all, uh, Blue Lake Mountain and uh, also known as uh, Antonio Marawal of the Taos Pueblo tribe. He was a member of the Taos Pueblo Council and uh, he lived here until he died. My dear friend, Dr. Young, many moons gone by since I hear from you. I've been thinking of you many times to write to you, but I lost your address. You know, you corresponded with a lot of people. And, and as a child, uh, I was always over at his house and I would see some of the letters that some of the people would, would write to him. My dear friend, Mountain Lake, it was very nice of you indeed that you wrote a letter to me. I thought you had quite forgotten me. I often thought of you in the meantime. 
And I even talked of you often to my pupils. Are your young men still Sometimes he would be sitting sun? there. He had a big Could table. Um, it was a dining table, but he used it for a desk, you know, and he had all his his uh, boxes of paper and, and whatever, you know, and he would be sitting there sometimes writing letters to people. Ten years after our religion is destroyed, the whole world will see that we have been working for the whole world. As I told you, our great father, the son, is the one who supports the whole world. And that's our duties to help our great father, the son. I really don't know maybe to what depth he told Young, but uh, he, he made an impression on him and Dr. Young made an impression on my grandfather. My old Pueblo friend thought that the raison d'etre of his Pueblo had been to help the son to cross the sky. I envied him for the fullness of meaning in that belief. That was my grandfather's philosophy, that if our Taos Pueblo Indians stopped practicing their religion, he said, give or uh, take 10 years that the whole world would end. After all, that's what's keeping this world going. Mountain Lake was the English name of Oquia Piano, a Pueblo elder who took So the clip that we just saw was recorded in a film uh, made in 1989 called Wisdom of the Dream. And there's also a book by the same title. Uh, Bauman, Dieter Bauman is featured in the film as well and examines the relationship between Jung and Tony Mirabal as an authentic conversation made possible by an appreciation for viewing the archetypal realm from another cultural point of view. So the golden thread of relatedness was further carried in letters. And it's relevant to note that prior to the 1962 publication of Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, knowledge of Jung's trip to Taos Pueblo in 25 was communicated in letters and in uh, some uh, reports and papers. For example, the Taos Pueblo newspaper uh, noted that he was visiting. And as I had mentioned previously, the New York Times had a, a brief uh, mention of, of his visit in New York and departure on the 14th of of January. This is an interview that um, my husband and I conducted with Katie Sanford in March of 2011. We went to Taos in 1971. Sandy had a conference in Denver and uh, we went then to Taos because James Kirsch had told us that Tony Mirabel was still alive. And uh, and went in there and asked, you know, and they, we were directed to his house and he was elegant, elegant old man. And and I, and quite sad because his son had committed suicide the year before. And if he, if he had trouble hearing and he had arthritis. So he was lying in his bed and Sandy and I just sat on the bed and talked to him. And you, you know, you had to get close for him to hear you. And it's, uh, well, I think it's indicative of their, their, well, they were more related. To, they don't, they're more related to the body and to sexuality and all. And after we 
after we left there, uh, we had an ongoing relationship with Tony Mirabelle, I think until right up to about the time of his death, that we stayed in correspondence. And, uh, and he said, both Sandy and me, he had made moccasins for us, that he wanted to send us something. Mm -hmm. So he had made these moccasins. And I asked him when we were there, I said, do you remember? Do you remember Jung? Do you remember meeting with Jung? And he said, oh, yes. We talked. We talked right up on the roof over there. We had a very, very interesting man. And I think it was shortly after we had met with him that they were able to finally get Blue Lake back, which was sort of their secret, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they make their sacred trips mm -hmm. to Blue Lake. So it was a remarkable connection. Elliot, old man, he corresponded with Sandy and, uh, uh, you know, very often to both of us. We went to Taos in 1971. So that, I hope you enjoyed that little clip of Katie talking about journeying to see Quibiano in 71 and then some of the correspondence. I wanted to show a little, this is a map of the Taos Pueblo and one enters along this pathway and the, the north, you walk in and around and the northern Pueblo is here. And there's this little bridge that one crosses and, and you go over to this, the south Pueblo, uh, which is very, looks very, very similar to the north Pueblo. Um, but the, the Pueblo is open to the public and the Buffalo dance is open to the public uh, if you ever wish to go. Uh, Jennifer Maxson from the archive uh, reproduced these images that were shown in the previous clip. I thought it might be fun for you to see them up close. So this is the photographs that Sandy took of Alcoy Biano, also known as Tony Mirabal uh, at Taos Pueblo in 1971. We went to Taos in, oh, went sorry, to Taos sorry, sorry. in 1971. Sandy had a Sandy in Denver. We went. Sorry. Um, so I want to segue off of, of the experience of their being there and, and just note that uh, Dr. James Kirsch who founded the Jungian Institute in Los Angeles, a, was a German Jewish psychiatrist who founded Jungian communities in Berlin, Tel Aviv, London, and Los Angeles, had a 32 year correspondence with Jung, which is documented in uh, Anne Lammer's edited book, The Jung Kirsch Letters, the correspondence of C.G. Jung and James Kirsch. And it's a wonderful collection of letters that in which both men are wrangling the spirit of the times, wrangling the, the occurrences in Europe and the decisions of Kirsch and uh, Eric Neumann to go to Israel. Uh, it was an incredibly intense time and the, the they really argue and fight with each other in the correspondence. So I strongly, it's sort of an aside from this topic, but why it's relevant is that um, Sandy was in analysis with Kirsch and, uh, 
and Kirsha at the same time was, uh, had been in communication with Jung until the time of his death in 61. So here's a transcript of one of the letters. Dear Sandy, I'm very happy you could talk to the old man, Tony Mirabal. I hope we can get together soon and exchange our ideas and see what we can do for him. I also think I should follow John Talley's recommendation to write to Congress to recommend the return of Blue Lake to tribal ownership. So when, when Sandy, when uh, Kier says, see what we can do for him, he's talking about uh, Alcoibiano's health. Uh, Sandy was a practicing physician and frequently on his trips out to the Southwest took uh, medicine for uh, his friends, uh, some of whom became his patients, whom he treated for free. Uh, so prior to this October 1970 letter in June, James Kirsch had written to Sandy saying, the name of the Indian chief is Akwe Biano, mentioned on page 247 of Jung's Memories. He goes by the name of Antonio Mirabal. He's an old man now, hard of hearing and suffering from rheumatism. It would be wonderful if you would visit him. Maybe we could find out what could be done for him. And then uh, later, Kirsch writes, there's not much I can tell you about Taos Pueblo. It's about three miles from the city of Taos. When you arrive at the Pueblo, someone comes and tells you where to park your car and you pay him and ask him where Antonio Mirabal is. He will direct you to Mirabal's room. One has to cross a little creek where Jung also which Jung also mentioned in his report. So as Katie said, in September, 1971, they drove from Colorado to Taos and held their conversations with Mirabal. And Tony, uh, Sandy took notes of their meeting and in the, side, in the side margin, he notes, told to me by Tony Mirabal, we, Mirabal and others, went as delegates to New York. From the 16th floor, we saw people, cars, streetcars, some people come out of the earth and Sandy notes in parentheses, people come out of the subway. Mirabal continues, I can see what, why there are so many white people. After they die, they come back out of the earth. And I have to say that, that I heard that also from some Australian Aborigines who were on a tour in 1980-81 of the United States. And for some reason, they were put on the 18th floor of a building. And they, they just, they were so upset because as they looked down and saw these tiny little people, they thought they were seeing people come back from the dead. So the Columbia University where they were staying arranged for them to stay on, I think first and second floor building. So the Sanfords continued intermittent visits and maintained an active correspondence with uh, Tony Mirabal until his death in 1976. So here's some images of Katie as she's arranging all this material in preparation for its delivery to the Opus Archive and Research Center, where it is now. And you can make appointments and uh, with Jennifer, hopefully when the pandemic's over, we could return to the archive uh, to see this material for yourself if it interests you. Another letter from Tony Mirabal. This is to Sandy Sanford. Dear friend, today I'm sending you a pair of moccasins that I made for you as a Christmas present. I would be very glad for you to have what I make myself made by my foot measure. I don't know if they are too big or too small for you. I would be very glad for you to have what I make myself. Your friend, Tony Mirabal. more pictures of Katie rearranging the, the, or arranging the letters from Mirabal to Sandy. 
And this is a, a clip of a photo that you may recognize from Evan's face-to-face -face interview that was conducted in 1959. But before we get there, I think I'll just go back for a minute. Deirdre Baird, in her biography of Jung notes, Antonio Mirabal had persuaded George Porter to harness his considerable political clout on behalf of the Pueblo and its efforts to win back the Blue Lake, source of the Taos River and most sacred shrine of the Pueblo religion. Kirsch's note about writing to Congress galvanized Sandy Sanford and with Katie and others in San Diego and Los Angeles, they wrote letters to their senators and congressmen in support of the return of Blue Lake to the Taos Pueblo. Regina Schweitzer, Zurich analyst, noted that Jung's strong ethical engagement with civic matters were ex exemplified by his dedicated military service, his active participation in local matters of government, governance in Kuznacht and Bollingen, Jung's letter writing campaigns in support of town and canton issues that mattered to him were frequent, frequently published in the local paper. And noteworthy to me is the relatedness that characterized the friendship with Tony Mirabal, which was translated into effective social action evidenced in the Keir Stanford writings letters in an active and informed civic responsibility to engage in a letter writing campaign in support of the Taos Pueblo's fight for the return of Blue Lake, Blue Lake which, has been under, which had been taken by President Theodore Roosevelt for a national forest in 1906. I think of all the letter writing campaigns that we were doing uh, leading up to the presidential vote, encouraging people to register to vote, et cetera. And I know there are a number of people, particularly young people, for writing postcards uh, to Georgia, encouraging people to, well, now the registration date is over, but to register and then to vote on January 5th. So on De December 15th, 1970, President Nixon signed Public Law 91-550, approved in a bipartisan manner by the United States Congress. In speaking of the bill's significance, President Nixon stated, this is a bill that represents justice because in 1906, an injustice was done in which land involved in this bill, 48,000 acres, was taken from the Indians involved, the Taos Pueblo Indians. The Congress of the United States now returns that land to whom it belongs. On December 14th, 1972, Okoibiano writes to the Sanfords, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Sanford, I'm very glad to get your letter today. As you know, since I took two operations last April that left me very weak and nervous, I'm not able to do anything. And sometimes the snow starts early part of November. It snowed almost every three days and it is very cold up till now. I'm having a very hard time up to now. I have to stay in the house all day as the snow is all over Taos Valley. There's nothing I can do about it. I had to take it, whatever is coming, but I'm glad that we got our Blue Lake back in my lifetime. I stop here and I'm glad you are both well. There's nothing better than to be in health. Your friend, Tony Mirabal. That really strikes a chord for me as we're dealing with the pandemic and so deeply concerned with our own health, our family members' health, and health of neighbors, community members, people in our state, people in other states, and the profound suffering of doctors and uh, nurses and other caregivers who are tending to people who enter the hospital with COVID. December 22nd, 1972, another letter from uh, Mirabal. Dear friend Sanford and family, I send you a book for Christmas. I hope you like it. I would like to send you something that I made myself, but since I am in poor health, I do not do anything. 
And then January 8th, 1973, dear friends, Sanford and family, I wanted to thank you for the package you send for your kindness. I don't have much news to tell you, only as you know, we have are having terrible bad weather since first part of November. So Sanford carried, further carried the golden thread of connection established by Jung with Tony Mirabal into the Jungian community in his correspondence with analyst Mokosun Miyuki and others who were interested in the people and culture of the Taos Pueblo and the lineage of friendship with Viano Mirabal. Martha Suazo write, writes to Sanford, since I read Jung's description of his experience with Tony Baraball, I have been thinking of the profound influence Jung received in his experiences with the Indian culture. Thank you very much for your kind trouble again, and please give my best regards to Katie. Sincerely yours, Martha Suazo. So the golden thread of relatedness in the above correspondence ev evidences an attitude with which one relates, encountering the other with an ethos grounded in the principle of eros or principle of relationship accomp accomplished by managing projections, interpretations, and reductive judgments. In contemporary experience, we're engaged in encounters with the other on a global scale and are asked to become conscious of the lived experience of others who are personally very different from ourselves and from each other. An interested, attentive listening to patients as well as the practice of active imagination. Jung evolved in his confrontation with the unconscious. All form a foundation for encountering the internal other, the ethos of dream work and active imagination with engaged attention to and relationship with dream figures themselves often quite different from the lived reality of our outer world, serve to support encounters of difference experienced in the outer world and make possible ensuing dialogue, deep understanding and reparation, holding as they do the seeds of potential mutual transformation and deep relatedness. I'm going to read this quote of Jung's. The world hangs by a thin thread and that thread is the psyche of man. Nowadays, we're not threatened by elemental catastrophe. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? And so it is demonstrated in our day what the power of the psyche is how important it is to know something about it, but we know nothing. This is from C.G. Jung's uh, interview with John Freeman in the BBC Face to Face, 1959. To contemporize this quote, we are today in danger of essential catastrophe, of elemental catastrophes, and we are endangered by the reckless psyches of world leaders. And as Jung noted, it is, a, it is important to attend to psyche, to know something about it, for we are the great danger. So I would say it's also important for us to pick up the golden thread of relatedness and carry it into our work with our, on ourselves, most importantly, and uh, carry it with us into our social action in support of equity, and righting the wrongs of injustices. That concludes my talk. We can take a little break. Judy, I think I turn this over to you, right? Sure. Um, so uh, I have um, changed the settings so that your people are able to unmute themselves. Um, and please use the raise hand feature to ask a question. And I will see it and I will acknowledge you. Uh, somebody did send me an email earlier asking uh, the, while you were all waiting to, to join the program, we were playing um, 
music and slides that Willow provided. And so somebody um, sent me uh, an email asking what the music is. The Can music? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the music, music is by John, John Rainier, Rainier Jr. R A I E R. What was the first name? John J O H N Rainier. Okay. Junior. Don D O H N J J O John John Rainier. Okay. John Rainier. House House Bow. And go to the public today. You can go to his little shop and purchase this piece. And the and photograph the photographs, photographs that I took when I was in the house. Please mute, mute yourself, yourself if you're, if not, you're not. not. Um. So Susan Negley, uh, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I can't hear. Her. We're not hearing you. She, she muted. muted. Oh, oh. She was unmuted and she got muted. Hmm. Susan, are you there? Well, we, don't, we can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what's happening today. <laughs> She's muted. Judy, no, she, she's not <laughs> muted. Susan Negley is not muted. Can she Can check, check the question? question? No, um, I don't have chat on, so we can't do that. Uh, uh, I, could I could give you one word. Well, your voice. OK, well, we see you. I don't know why it's not working. We're having a. Funny day. You can't, can't hear you. Your voice reverberated. Yeah, do you a lot of feedback to your? In mine? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why. I don't have another device on. I don't know why that would be. Well, I'll mute myself and see if that helps. Yes, that works. If if there are more than one person unmuted and speaking, there's very bad feedback. So just mute yourself if you're not speaking. Glad Willow. So Willow, I'm I'm a, an analyst in Texas and have a strong connection to New Mexico, have been going to Tuas Pueblo and, and New Mexico since I was a small child. And, you know, I, I really was very uh, glad that the end of your very informative um, presentation that you spoke to the thread that speaks to um, the Taos Pueblo and, and activism as living people now. So the Taos Pueblo for now, almost a year is thoroughly shut down. The people are thoroughly quarantined and sequestered. They do not have the same access to health, um, um, to getting help as we do. And um, that they are still living their myths and they're still practicing for us. In, in a living way. So my conversation with my friend, I'll just end with this, uh, Miko Concha, who is Tiwa, who lives in the Taos Pueblo. They are sort of desperate for resources because the Pueblo shut down. And so the tourists that were coming in and the money that was coming in, they don't have that. So I asked, um, Miko, if he would send me for my family some clay uh, 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 images of the bear, of the, of the bear that he makes. He mines the clay, it's pure alchemy. The clay has mica in it. He cleans the clay, he creates these beautiful bear 
And then as we were talking yesterday, he said, you know about the bear, Susan, and I don't pretend to know fully about the bear. He said, the bear are healers. And the Tiwa people long ago were walking and they were dying, they had no water. And they came upon the bear and the bear led them to the water and it saved them. So the bear has become an important healing image and symbol for them, but in a very living way. So I wanted to just share that and I very much appreciate your talk. And um, that's all I got. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much for sharing that. And to add another thought about what we do, we do for the world. I, th I think Jung took that in on such a very deep level and has encouraged all of us to live our presence in service of psyche, which is also in service of the world. Willow, I wanna ask you, do you have any other devices watching, doing this program near your computer? Cause I see that your family members are on. Maybe that, is that, could that be the problem? Well, no, my daughter is in Los Angeles, so she's not nearby. And I, I suspect that my husband is muted. I'd have to check his view to see if he is, but. But if his sound is on for him to be listening and he's nearby, that could be a problem. Okay. okay. He's saying he has earphones on. That's not the problem. Well, all right. Um, Herminia. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Can you, can hear, you me? hear me? Okay. Um, I was just wondering how we could um, contribute to helping uh, the Taos Pueblo either by donation or by buying the clay bears or how would we have access to that? Is Susan able to speak to this? Susan, can you speak to this? her Judy and what I can do is make contact with Susan and ask her for that information and uh, perhaps the club could post it on the website or yeah, I, could, I, could. I could post it on my, uh, in my under my resources on my website. Susan uh, are you able to talk to us? I've unmuted but it's not coming through. It is, it is now. Oh, can you hear me? Should I repeat the question? <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear me. You, well, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I'm happy to share the information. <laughs> Very happy to share the information. So email me and I'd love to send the information to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dennis Merritt. He has to unmute. Dennis, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, oh, I thought I did. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I have a, a session coming up with somebody in China 
at eight. So I have to leave soon, but uh, just thank you so much for that presentation. And it reminds me that Jung said one of the challenges for modern men and women was to unite with the two million year old man within, I like to call it the indigenous one within. And one of his big concerns uh, back, you know, before he died was the rape of the uh, existent uh, indigenous cultures. So he was so deeply concerned about that. And I think it might've been the Taos, but they thought him as a bear, the way he walked down the ladders. Uh, so he had that deep connection with the land. Of, and I, I personally have had a lot of experience with the Lakota Sioux ceremonies. And I've got to say, when you are together with some of those deeply spiritual people, you can't really describe it. And, and it just affected me so deeply to think that, you know, our white culture just thought of them as pagans and, and so on. And uh, my dear friend, Fred Gustafson, uh, did a lot of sun dances uh, with uh, Lakota on the Rosebud Reservation. I see they just got some land back from the Jesuits. Uh, and he just wrote so beautifully, Dancing Between Two Worlds, about his experience with them. So I've got to go now and call my analysis in China. But again, thank you so much. And a thank you that image of the sacred bear. They did talk about Yun being a lumbering bear going up and down those those right, ladders. Right, right. Thank yep. you for that memory and for and for raising your hand and sharing that. Okay, thanks. Good luck with your conversation. Say hello to China. <laughs> I love China. Uh, Candida Joan. Yes, um, hello, and thank you so much, um, Willow, for your wonderful presentation. I live in New Mexico, and um, you did such a phenomenal job for someone who is not native to New Mexico. It's most impressive. Um, I came across this excerpt in a heuristic study after two vision quests, and I was in an ecotherapy program in Santa Fe. And um, what really struck me and what I got from this and which you elaborated on is the journey from the head to the heart that that is the essence of what is lacking in the Eurocentric cultures. And that we know now that as we integrate all parts of our three brains, although that's an oversimplification, we are now listening more to our heart than to our neocortex in being able to ascertain what is actually accurate. And so this to me is one of the most important passages and something that we all need to embrace um, certainly, in addition to the fact that we are in such a cleave culture right now, and to be able to cross the social barrier and find sustenance and inspiration and understanding from one another is so vital. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you've done. Well, Kadita, thank you for your beautiful use of language and for reiterating that value of moving from the head to the heart. Okay, Lee, go ahead. I'm just going to, so I'm sorry I didn't get into this until 4.30, but thank you for having it. I learned more about Katie Sanford than almost two decades of knowing her uh, down in Del Mar, was at her house and she and Sandy, I mean, they, they're just not very, you know, they don't brag, <laughs> they, don't, they don't really, uh, I didn't know they went to Taos and, and I, I mean, I first went to Taos in 74, but I didn't even know who Jung was till 84 through Stuart Emery, um, who started actualizations. And then later Patty Westerbeck loaned me her copy of Dreams, uh, recollection, you know, that the Brown book, I call it. Um, so. Anyway, uh, I saw, uh, you know, Sandy and, and Katie every month at Friends of Young uh, San Diego chapter in Del Mar and just right up until I moved here uh, in 2016 and then she passed a year later. But I, I just thank you so much for 
teaching me about them. <laughs> they were right under my nose and I didn't know really quite how close they were uh, and, and to get the lake back and all. I mean, they were just so instrumental, so. Anyway. Well, Lee, if you want to know more about Katie, there's a wonderful video interview of her that was uh, produced by Bianca Dalder and Christophe Lumelier of the, he's the executive director of the LA Institute. Anyway, you can call the bookstore and purchase a copy of that disc. And it's a, a multi-faceted interview with Katie. Really well worth watching. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, it it wasn't until years later that I uh, I ran into uh, James Hillman and I I got to work with him for three three different workshops, two wild man workshops with Robert Bly, and then and then just James at the, mm -hmm. at the conference center in the Berkshires of Massachusetts back in '89 or '90, and, mm -hmm. and I remember sitting this close to him at lunch as close as you are on the screen right now. I look back now and I think, God, you know, he passed a few years back. You know, I didn't even know, somebody told me. And I thought, you know, people just die and you just don't know if, you know, if, if somebody doesn't tell you and, and they're gone, you know? And you think, God, I was with that person. I learned so much from that person. And so it just kind of saddens me. But I'm grateful, you know, that I was in their presence while they were here. So thank you, mm -hmm. everyone. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, looks like those are all our questions. Um, sorry we had all this. I don't know what the technical difficulty was this time. We haven't had it before. Um, but uh, thank you so much. And I want to mention that Dennis Merritt, who uh, asked the question and then had to go to a client in China, he's going to be giving us a talk um, sometime in the uh, after January on the I Ching. So we'll be announcing that at some point in the future. So thank you, Willow, very much for this really, really interesting talk. And uh, happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And hope to see you all next Thank month. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.